Hello. I see somebody's on. Can you hear me? I'll wait a few more minutes and give people time to, to get on. Thanks for joining. Hi, Shanna. Oh, there we go. <laughs> there you are. Hi. How are you? Quite know how to use these things. <laughs> Good. Trying it's to see weird. An adventure. I'm like in this weird, empty room, and it's probably really echoey. But uh, it's not too bad. I'm just giving people a couple of minutes to join. Yeah. Am I the first one on? There's another person on. Uh, she's proctoring an exam, so she's on quietly. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> I, know, I love it too. I totally do. People, people would, when I used to have my different job, I was on conference calls constantly. So <laughs> yep. sometimes I would do personal conference calls, but people just thought I was on a call for work because I, I was so attached to my phone all the time. <laughs> Understood. Yeah. <laughs> Good deal. Where are you that you have a giant room? Um, well, I'm at work, but this is one of our demo rooms. So we're lighting rep agency um so we rep major commercial lighting vendors gotcha so we have these big rooms for training vendors can come in and do trainings or we display some of the lighting that uh, our vendors sell um so the contractors can come in mm. and take the various examples and yeah yeah so if it's a little too echoey i can try to move <laughs> no it's fine it's not bad at all it's totally fine okay totally fine. so many Oh, in the room where my desk is that I'm like, eh. <laughs> uh, it's hard. It's hard. Well, yeah. let's, I'm a big believer in starting meetings like basically on time. So awesome. some people might jump in, you know, everyone's schedules are so busy and all of us are on, we have a very broad range of time zone people in this challenge. So it's yeah. really hard to know uh, who's going to be able to make it or not. Just sure. FYI, I am recording this. Um, so just FYI, you're being recorded. <laughs> I see that. <laughs> I um, all do you have any, do you guys have any questions? And I've got the chat box open um, also, maybe because there's two of you guys on the call. Maybe we should introduce ourselves. So I, I guess let me start. I'm Shelly. You guys have been listening to me the last several days, so my, my voice and bass is familiar to you. Um, do you want to introduce yourself, Shanna? 
Uh, I'm Shanna, and uh, yeah, I put it all out there on the Facebook, but <laughs> uh, I work full time and, you know, doing the horse hobby and helping to grow in my skills and be more competitive. I love the show ring and want to get better. So Fun. cool. And then our other person on, I can only see your username, but we, I know you can't talk, but what, can we type in who this really is? See if it's coming. I could see our or Robisol. Oh, Linda! The, I, the second I said your name out loud, I'm like, oh, that's Linda. <laughs> Hi, Linda. Thanks for joining. <laughs> okay. Well, do you guys have any questions? And Linda, if you type them in the chat box, I'll see them. Otherwise, I will come up. I have a couple things to add, but I want to make sure I answer your questions first. Um, yeah, I should have thought of questions. Okay. I think the biggest thing still, and we've been talking and talking about it, is um, the difference between sucking it in mm -hmm. for core support versus going out. And I find I have to really pay attention Yeah. because I've been doing the other method for so long mm -hmm. that, you know, it's like, well, wait a minute, I've got the sides in the back too. So... This morning's tip about, you know, punch, kind of punching yourself was helpful. Mm -hmm. um, I'm trying to still determine is it, you know, tightening all those muscles is almost like you, when you inhale in and your whole diaphragm expands, are you looking for that too or just the tightening of the muscles all the way around? If that makes sense. Yeah. Like, no, no, I, can, I can inhale, I can push my diaphragm out and inhale and stick and get everything way out. Right. But when I'm trying to tighten the core, it, it's more subtle than that. Mm -hmm. So, but I think that you're onto something in terms of like teaching your brain. So when we inhale, what happens is what, what's happening is our diaphragm is going down. That's why actually our belly, when you breathe properly and use your diaphragm, when you inhale, your belly rises is because mm -hmm. your diaphragm is going down. So imagine it's kind of like smushing all your internal organs. Like it's, it's pushing everything down because then that gives our lungs more room and the air rushes in. Um, our lungs don't like, there's not any muscles in our lungs that are actively pulling air in. They fill, Oh, what's that term? They just fill by a, a pressure change. So when our diaphragm goes down, there's a pressure change in our lungs and the air comes in. When our diaphragm comes up, there's a pressure change in our lungs and the air comes out. Um, so they call that something like passive air exchange, I think is what it's called. Um, you'll see people like, <clears throat> if you ever know somebody who's, who's sick from like a pulmonary disease or something, mm -hmm. their chest, like their muscles on the top of their chest have actually gotten really pretty big because they've lost that like passive air exchange ability and they're having to actively like use muscles to kind of like force uh, their, their air exchange. Sure. Um, but if you're healthy, the diaphragm going down, air rushes in, diaphragm comes up, air goes out, and then that's that. We use some of our accessory muscles like at the top of our chest to basically like piston up our ribs mm -hmm. to allow more expansion of the lungs. Um, but the primary mover is the diaphragm. So I think you're onto something in that like when you're first learning this to take that breath in and go ahead and, you know, feel your belly go out like that is the first step in a way it's just a little bit more dramatic than what you what you need in real life but it's it's a really good thing it's a really good tool to use to train your brain so go ahead and take the the big first step right of like bring your diaphragm down because that you got to seal the top of the pop can but then you do want to add the rest of the muscles right and that's the piece if you just took the big breath in that's the piece you'd be that's a piece you'd be missing. Sometimes right. I find with people the, the easiest next set of muscles to find is our pelvic floor. Because if you bear down hard enough and you don't seal the pelvic floor, like you will pee your pants a little bit. You know what I mean? And that's, it, it especially if you're over 50. <laughs> yeah, or you've had babies. I mean, like nobody talks about it, but so many yeah. women and men have pelvic floor problems. Um, yeah. It's, you know, it's like that little thing that nobody wants to talk about, but everybody's dealing with. Um, 
So, but, but, you know, not that I want anybody to pee their pants, but right. it is like obviously a tactile cue, right? Where you can be like, okay, seal the top of the pop can, didn't seal the bottom of the pop can. And it's like literally just an easy group of muscles to feel and find. Because when mm -hmm. I start to talk to you about like the muscles on the side and on your back, those are deep muscles and they're firing and they're moving like that much. And now we start to get into the nuances of like, you know, did you feel that? And my, my clients will be like, you are crazy. I have no idea what you're talking about. <laughs> so I do think like taking the big step, you know, take a big inhalation, push that diaphragm down. And then you can even like, you know, go a little further and like brace a little further and you're going to feel there's a moment that your pelvic floor starts to like engage a little bit. And then you're like, okay, so I got the top, I got the bottom. Now it's the sides I'm missing. And those sides, like if you take your hands and you wrap them around so that your thumbs are kind of on either side of your back and then your hands are wrapped around the cue you guys have heard me do, but it's hard to get initially. Let me, I've got my computer stacked on a book because otherwise it's too low, but I'm going to make it low so you can kind of see me a little bit better. I have three dogs around me, so I have to be very careful. Moving. <laughs> I give a lot of webinars. And my dogs are always like, the second they hear me start to talk, they go to sleep. They're like, oh, she's going to talk to herself. <laughs> Love it. So if you wrap your hands around you, just appreciate for a second how much flesh, I guess, you have, you have in your hand. And then when you brace, what I want you to do is feel like your belly moves out just, I mean, it's subtle, just a little bit. Like it kind of fills your hand, right? So if I brace a little bit, I feel those muscles underneath my hands swell for lack of a better word. And just, and that's all it is. Like it's not, it's not some big thing. Yeah. Feel that? So different then. It's so very different. different. Feels so different, yeah. If you're having trouble, if you're having trouble feeling it, did you feel it, Linda? Okay. If you're having trouble feeling it, another really awesome way to do this is go lift something heavy, like a hay bale, uh, a weight at the gym, because you will, you you actually very naturally do this when the load is big enough. It's just really hard to do when the load isn't big. You know, but we've all done that thing, like if we're going to lift a hay bale or something where there's that moment that you feel you, you, can't, you hold your breath and you can't talk just for the second while you put it up on the truck or wherever. Mm -hmm. If you could have your hands around your waist at that moment, you would feel that expansion because your body's making you very, very stiff so that you can translate that power. Does that make sense? Okay. Yeah. But I think go with the breathing cue. Like it's okay to be that dramatic. And then the goal will be as it gets easier to not have to take some big breath, but instead just be like, set it. Okay. Perfect. Any other questions? Okay. Okay. Linda says, I need to be stronger. But my biggest problem, I think, is getting the arch out of my low back. Ah, tucking my pelvis and getting my back to a neutral spine. Okay. This is a good one. So when people have too much arch in their back from a biomechanical point of view, we call that extension. Um, so if you think about vertebrae are stacked, if I open up the front of my vertebrae, I'm, I'm, I'm extending them. And if I open up the back of my vertebrae, I'm flexing my vertebrae. So you're going to hear me use the word extension. And I'm, I mean, you're arching your back. Um, so if people are having a hard time de decreasing the arch in their back, I mean, there's, there's a couple things I would think about here. First of all, my neutral is not necessarily your neutral. Like sometimes when you watch, um, like if you go to a group fitness class or you like read an article, people overgeneralize, like they say, put your back flat on the floor or, you know, what neutral spine is, is your back is almost in contact with the floor or something, but that's actually not true. Like neutral is in the middle of your range of motion. And all of us are built a little bit differently. Like the way our spines curve, the way our hip, our pelvis is built, all that kind of stuff. So some people just naturally have a little bit of a bigger curve. And then 
they don't flatten as much. Other people are like super flat as a pancake and have hardly any curve. You have to figure out what your range of motion ability is, and then you go to the middle of it. So, so just keep that in mind that sometimes you do keep an arch in your back and it doesn't mean you're not in neutral. Like you can actually be in neutral with that little bit of bend. But sometimes people lose their full range of motion because of muscle tightness. So life happens, you know, we just like over the years, we habituate, we move a certain way and we end up with, there's a, there's a couple kind of typical things that cause too much arch in the back. One is tight hip flexors, probably, probably the most common thing we find in society because we drive a lot. We sit at a computer a lot. Even riders, like if you think about we're, we're active riding our horses, but we're sitting on our horse. So like we're always in a hip flexion world. So if your hip flexors get tight, the very top of your hip flexor actually attaches to the some of your um, lumbar vertebrae in your spine and will be pulling them forward. So that can make more arch. The other thing I think that can create too much of an arch is if our, um, our thoracic spine, so like our middle spine, gets too much of a bend in it. I'm exaggerating here. But, so if you're really having trouble getting the arch out of your back and you don't think that's your neutral, you think you're too tight, I would focus a lot on the hip flexor stretches and the thoracic spine mobilization drills that, we, we, that we'll do throughout the challenge. If, our, if we have too much of a forward curve in our middle back, the curves in our spine are compensatory to each other because they are trying to allow us to stand up against gravity. So if I like end up putting my head forward a little bit, it means that my middle curve has to increase it, its curve to compensate for the increase in the top curve. And then my bottom curve has to increase to compensate for the middle curve. Otherwise, what happens is we wouldn't be able to stand up against gravity. We would end up like a leaning tower of Pisa and we would fall down or, or just have to use like so much muscle energy. It'd be like a diet plan. We would be super skinny after a while because we'd be using so many calories just to stand up. So if you really feel like your low back is, is kind of stuck and that's not its natural position, I would go after the either side of it, go after the hip flexors, go after the thoracic spine. And after a couple weeks, usually people will feel those start to yield and they'll say they've got more mobility in their, their low back. Does that make sense? Okay. Um, I had another thought. I have to remember what it was. Let me read your question again. A hard time talking about this. Today, in today's training, so the other thing that can cause this problem is that your, your muscles on either side of your spine, your paraspinal muscles, are really tight. And in today's training, I put a video of a paraspinal muscle release. It would be interesting for you to do that drill and then try to like go on the floor and do cat cow and find neutral. And let me know if you feel like you have more range of motion. Cause if you do, then you might just have like some really tight muscles that need to be released. And that, that video I put up today, it feels so good and it's really helpful to releasing those. So try that and let me know how it, how it goes. All right. Anything else? Okay. If you don't, guys don't have questions, I want to talk a little bit about the pelvic floor. Um, the, and if questions come up, just feel free to interrupt me. But I thought, um, usually when I do these trainings, I like to have a few training topics in my pocket because everyone's interested in listening, but either doesn't have a question or I find on the pelvic floor, like people are embarrassed to ask their question. I'm not embarrassed about the pelvic floor. I talk about it all the time. So I'm going to talk about it. <laughs> awesome. Um, when I've done these challenges in the past, uh, this is the topic that people are like, oh, I wish you would have talked about that more. So I thought I would throw it into these Ask a Physical Therapist sessions. Um, just because many women who have had, had children or are over their mid-40s, that kind of stuff, start to struggle a little bit with pelvic floor. Um, also pelvic floor, actually athletes struggle a lot with their pelvic floor. They, they're like, they've gotten so fit. It's almost like their pelvic floor has gotten too tight. And then they, they struggle. 
they struggle with it too. So it's a really common problem and it, it ties in like, it absolutely ties in with core strength. You can't have good core strength if you don't have a good functioning pelvic floor. So this course, like rehab of the pelvic floor, activation of the pelvic floor is kind of beyond this course. But um, I think in the future, near future, I am going to do a program on this. Um, be cool. and we have one training next week on it, which kind of just like barely dips your toe in the water. Um, in physical therapy, like there are literally physical therapists who do nothing but pelvic floor rehab. Like it's a really big area. But let me tell you my little spiel on it. So there's two big camps of problems with the pelvic floor. If we look at like our buckets, like two big buckets of problems, you can either have a pelvic floor that's too tight. And so this is like um, with people who have pelvic floors that are too tight, you, the muscles are always contracted. It's like, it's almost like the bottom of the pop can is like always in place. And if you are in this camp, you tend to have some pain problems going on. Like you have pain with urination, pain with sex, pain with riding sometimes. Um, like you just, you just, you can't even explain it. Like you just feel like something is like hanging you up. Um, and then the other camp is the pelvic floor is too loose. So you can think of the pelvic floor in our body, you know, imagine your pelvis. Pelvic floor is like a, a little bit of a hammock down there. And that hammock can either not have hardly any sw uh, sway to it, right? It's like almost a straight board, which is way too tight. So now when the, our internal organs and stuff sit on it, instead of being on a hammock, it's almost like they're on a trampoline and they're mm -hmm. like being bounced around. Or you can have a hammock that's just got so much sway in it that it wouldn't even be comfortable to rest in and everything's almost like falling out. And a lot of times if people are in that camp where things are too loose, like they don't have any pain problems or anything, but that camp of people will complain like, oh my gosh, like, I, like I'm having incontinence problems and I don't even realize I have to go to the bathroom. And then all of a sudden, like, I just, I just can't, I lose control. Or you even can have some prolapse problems. Like I've had, you know, women come to me and say like, I literally feel like my uterus is falling out and I have to wear a tampon, not because I need the tampon, but like to keep everything stuffed up there. And those are all very real things. And that's because the hammock has gotten too, too lax. And so the first step, like if you feel like the bottom of your pop can isn't engaging well, I always encourage people to ask, you know, to get an appointment with a pelvic floor specialist, because that's one of the first things they're going to do is figure out what camp you're in. Are you in the too tight camp? Or are you in the too loose camp? And then the treatment is a little bit the same in that um, it's a lot of exercises, either strengthening or relaxation exercises and awareness. And then we use a lot of biofeedback. So um, biofeedback can either be, uh, sometimes there's like a probe you can insert kind of like a tampon and then do some squeezing around it. Or there's these like electrodes you can put uh, outside of your body, but that get the muscle activation. And then basically there's a computer screen you look at and you do these exercises and you try to make the bars on the computer screen, you know, kind of like at the fair when you hit the hammer on that, on that uh, game, you try to get the bars of the computer screen to go up a certain level. Or if you have too much tension, you try to get relaxed and get the bars to go down a certain level. It's super effective because our pelvic floor is like, it's hard to connect our brain with it. But if we put it through these light bars on a computer, you can be like, oh, I, I took a deep breath and I made the lights go down or I engaged a certain way and they went up. And then you can start to kind of memorize what that feels like. So I always tell people that if you have, if you, if you feel like the bottom of your pop can isn't compressing properly or is painful, seek professional help because there's just, like there's nothing as useful as having a one-on-one -on -one session with a therapist who's trained in this, who can really help you. And sometimes even it's really like successful with people who are their pelvic floor is too tight. Like sometimes the therapist will even go and like do some like muscle stimulation or relaxation moves. Sometimes our tailbone, and I see this in riders sometimes because we fall off, like our tailbone gets a little tweaked, say you fell and you like landed on your butt. Our tailbone actually has a little bit of wiggle to it, but it can get overly bent and kind of jammed. 
and that can send a pain signal to your pelvic floor and now your pelvic floor is like on tension all the time because it's getting irritated from your tailbone and if somebody just goes in and literally like kind of pops your tailbone back in place the tension goes away like but all this stuff is really hard to do by yourself like you need you need that person to help you so um definitely seek seek professional help if you're having trouble and I know it's a hard topic to talk about, but just know you are not alone. This is, I don't even know what the numbers are, but I mean, there's thousands and thousands and thousands of people, men and women who have trouble with this um, in the U S men, you know, a lot of times if they have a prostatectomy because they have prostate cancer and stuff, unfortunately this is the side effect for them. And then they have to go into pelvic floor rehab and learn how to engage all those muscles. They actually have a much harder time with it than women because at least, you know, with us women, like, because of our anatomy and we are childbearing and all that kind of stuff, we're kind of used to like talking about it and feeling it. And if you've had babies, you're squishing, you know, people, everyone's seen it and all this kind of stuff. And with men, really, when they get to this point, they're like, you want me to do what? You want me to talk about what? <laughs> so that's my kind of caveat for the pelvic floor. But then the other thing I want to talk about is just like, you can't have good core strength without finding your pelvic floor. So as part of this two weeks, like take a little time and take a little time and really think about your pelvic floor. And you can even do this. Like, I like to do this exercise when I'm sitting at a stoplight because you know, time in a car is kind of wasted and you get stuck at a stoplight and literally just like, think about, can I, can I move my pelvic floor around? Right can I lift it? And then can I vol volitionally on command relax it? Can I, um, we teach people to kind of wink their sphincters, you know, like we've got our vaginal sphincter, we've got our uh, ureter, and we've got our anus. Like, can you close those, but not close the others? Like you can literally like play these kind of little games and it helps so much to get your brain connected to the bottom of that pop can. And then when you go to then do the core exercises, like if you've figured out how to connect yourself to your pelvic floor where you can be like, okay, lift it now, lower it now. Then when you go to engage the pelvic floor, you can, or I'm sorry, when you go to engage your core, you can make sure you feel the bottom of that pop can. Um, and so that's my, that's my two cents on that is use your time at stoplights you know, sit up tall. So you're not, so you're not leaning back against the seat. Cause that when you lean in kind of this like relaxed blah form, it's really hard to activate your muscles. So sit up tall. Don't be leaning against the seat of your car and then play a little game till the light turns green of lifting, lowering, lifting, lowering, and try to lift your pelvic floor without squeezing your butt. A lot of times people lift, but they squeeze everything. They're like lifting and they're like practically lifting themselves out of their seat, right? If you feel constrained by your, if you feel constrained by your seatbelt, you're lifting too much. <laughs> Very good. Does that make sense? <laughs> okay. Yeah. I, I think that that is one of the most helpful things. And then we also next week have a, a unit on breathing because that's the other part people have a hard time. They, they lose power. I find we people lose power of the pop can. They lose it out the top and the bottom. Um, either they just can't figure out how to keep the diaphragm engaged or they can't engage the pelvic uh, floor. So my little two cents on that pelvic floor. Good. Never thought about the floor in relation to the whole core strength mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. topic. <laughs> yeah. It's all about power leakage, you know? Um, yeah. It's, it's all, yeah. And if you lose that, if you, you know, go to create pressure, but it all leaks out the bottom, then your spine still doesn't have any stability. And then where you feel the problem is usually back pain. Mm -hmm. um, like that's a really, that's not an uncommon thing. People come in for back pain and then we, we assess them. And I end up, I end up being like, I need to refer you to pelvic floor rehab because actually that's, you can't yeah. We're not going to fix your back pain until you fix your pelvic floor. Wow. Um, and I'm not a pelvic floor therapist, uh, but there are people who are like experts in this and are ama amazing, amazing. Um, so anyway. Oops. Yeah, I, I just flipped this. 
<laughs> I saw a comment come in. I didn't see it. Um, Linda said, interesting about pelvic floor last September. I went off my horse, broke my pelvis in three pieces, and messed up a bunch of soft tissue and ah, including the pelvic floor. Yeah. So if you're mm -hmm. if you're still having trouble or you just don't feel quite right, um, it might be really interesting for you to get an assessment because if you look at, um, I should have had a diagram ready. If you look at how our pelvis is, a ton of muscles, probably, um, nine muscles attached to the inside ring of our pelvis to create that hammock for our pelvic floor. And depending where the break is and how much displacement your pelvis has, sometimes those muscle attachments can get, um, like if they got damaged at all, maybe had a little bleeding around them, they heal with a little bit of scar tissue. Um, and then it makes them so that when you contract them, they just don't, they don't contract quite right. And you can straighten that scar tissue out and it, it can totally get better. But a lot of times it takes like some very specific exercises and that kind of stuff. But that's where a pelvic floor therapist is just like one of the most useful human beings on the planet. So, wow. all right, anything else? Okay, thanks so much for jumping Great. on, you guys. Thanks for being in the challenge. Yeah. I appreciate it. It's fun. I love, <laughs> this. I love this challenge. So, yeah, this is great. It's been so educational already. So, cool. I'm excited. Okay, all right. Well, I'm going to let you go, get back to your exam. What, what are you, do you teach? What do you do, Linda? You a teacher? <laughs> oh, biology. Oh, cool. Genetic students. Oh, I loved my genetic class. <laughs> and that's Cool. I have two things I loved about my genetic class. I love genetics. And then I remember my professor was so cute. He was like, he was so, cute. I sometimes said, wanted to make up questions to go to his office hours. <laughs> <laughs> I like it. This is, my, this is my genetics class. I almost was motivated to become a geneticist after that. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, you guys have a great afternoon. I'll talk to you later. All right. Thank you, Shelly. Bye. Bye-bye.